Uh, again, good morning, colleagues and audience members. My name is Ed Reising. I am the chairman of the Land Use and Transportation Committee for the Baltimore City Council. This morning, we are here this morning to uh, conduct our first work session on City Council Bill 12 0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning. The Land Use and Transcript the Land Use and Transportation Committee intends to work progressively through the bill by reviewing it page by page, starting with Title I and continuing through the bill in the order it is written. City agencies and the public will be asked to participate by raising their questions or comments as the committee is discussing the page they have a comment or a question regarding. I encourage everyone to visit the City Council's website and to stay updated with the section of that bill that the Land Use and Transportation Committee is working on at, on at each work session. Uh, an example would be if the committee completes work on page 54 of Title I at one work session, the website will note that any, that an, an indicate that the committee will pick up on page 55 of Title I at the next work session. In addition to the currently scheduled series of work sessions, the Land Use and Transportation Committee will hold additional hearings and work sessions. Uh, information about those will be distributed to the public as soon as dates, times, and topics are selected. Again, please check the Baltimore City Council website for the most up-to-date information. Uh, if you are un unable to attend a scheduled work session and you wish to provide written comments or, and or amendments, please mail it to the Office of Council Services, attention to Antoine Banks at 101 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21202, or you can email at AntoineBanks at BaltimoreCity.gov. I welcome everyone to the City Council Chambers. As I stated, this is a a work session for the Land Use and Transportation Committee. This is not a hearing. We will not be taking public testimony. Um, this is a, uh, a legislative process, but what we're doing here for these work sessions, we are creating a, what's called, we're gonna call a legislative record. Um, at the next, this is definitions, at the next work session, well, regards to the next title, if we go through definitions, and we go on to Title II, we will have uh, maps supplied by the Planning Department, citywide maps, so that way the, the committee and the public can see the, the, the current zoning code and the proposed zoning, code, zoning, you know, zoning code that was adopted by the uh, Planning Commission. Um, the President of the City Council and uh, some of the members of the City, uh, yeah, the President of the City Council and some of the members of the City Council will not be here today because they are attending a funeral. Um, I am going to, uh, one of my ground rules is please turn off your cell phones, androids, uh, blackberries to give courtesy and respect to those who are going to be discussing these rules today, um, definition, I mean. Um, we are joined by Angela Gibson to my far right from the mayor's office. Also, we are joined by Kara Kuntz to my left from uh, President Jack Young's office. We are also joined by a uh, member of the committee, Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. Um, the legal representative which the, the, the committee has is Mr. John Willis to my left, um, is on board. We do have our own independent counsel. Um, and to my immediate left is Mr. Antoine Banks, who is the staff person for the uh, Land Use and Transportation Committee. So um, we do have a sign-in seat, and the sign-in seat isn't for testimony, it's for communication purposes. We want to keep a record. As I said earlier, uh, we're trying to create a legislative re record. So at this time... Um, Mr. Chair, is anyone keeping a record? Um, excuse me. You have a... Actually, that's a, um, that's a, I'm going 
glad you said that. Um, what kind of record could, can we be taking with all these amendments going on? I mean, is there a record actually going on so that, because I, you're not, we're not voting. So we're, it, theoretically, when we get all the way to the end of Ch Title 19, we come all the way back and look at the same amendments. So we're just going through and hearing yeah. about the amendments? Thank you, that's a, that's yeah. a good point, Councilwoman. Um, we are going to, we go through titles, 19 titles. When we go through each title, um, and the, the committee will uh, look over uh, all the amendments or recommendations or suggestions from committee members, agencies, and the general public, we will not be voting on any amendments. Um, each title, uh, we will have the um, councilmatic legislative reference, I mean, uh, councilmatic services, uh, Mr. Antoine Banks, and also Kara Kunz from President Jack Young's office, which, which they, what they will do is they will pile all those amendments and recommendations for each title, and at the end, we will go, when, we, when the time comes for us to vote for the bill and, and the amendments, we will take each title. So if there's, hypothetically, if there's 20 or 30 amendments to Title I, then what we'll do is we'll just, we ain't, we're not going to go over the, the bill again. We'll just do the process. We'll just look at the, in other words, wait, we wait, wait. The process, let me finish. The process would be, we will just go ahead and say, make a motion, and we will move it and second it. So. When we go back, Councilwoman, we're not going to be going back like we are now in this process of going through the bill page by page. Go ahead. So we'll um, be expected to kind of remember which ones we the, are for or against. The, the, it will be recorded by the, by the Councilmatic I mean, uh, services and through uh, Carol Kuntz through President Jack's office. All the amendments that have been taken. And John Willis, yeah, our lawyer, John. John so, so basically, we're going to go through, I've, I've heard it said line by line. Oh, page by page. Page by page. And then we'll come back to the beginning and we will review all the amendments that have been presented. I vote. We will vote. vote on them. Now, Will we then be accepting other amendments at that time? We we will be accepting minutes. Um, yeah, we will be accepting amendments all the way up till we go to second reader, because if we if we amend okay. the bill on second reader on the floor, then we have to post it again. So um, I really I want to thank you. I appreciate you bringing that. Uh, okay, I'm just yeah. So yeah. so that's the process, and basically it's. It's sort of on us to try to remember which one, which amendments. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I think our councilwoman, I, th and I, th I think our uh, councilmatic services and, and John Willis, Mr. Willis, and the president's office is going to well, is going to package this, and and all the council people and and the public who wishes to see it will it'll it'll be on the website, right? Yeah. You want to you want to you want to uh, respond? You can respond. It's open. Go ahead. One last question that I do have. At before we come back through with Title One, is there a way for us to get an interlineated or some kind of context so that we don't we can't just look at amendments that say, well, I have one that says financially is spelled wrong. You know, I, I you know, all right. You got to know where that is. I mean, you got to see it. I mean, everybody would probably take my word for yeah. it, but it's not spelled wrong. It's just not. It, it's in the wrong place. We're going to be very efficient. Okay. On our record. Fine. Um, so Ms. we take Kunt. our time. Yeah, Mr. Mr. The only thing I wanted to add, Kara comes from the Office of Council President Young, is they are being video recorded by cable channel 25, so it'll be televised at some point. We'll have the. DVDs, everything is being recorded, not just sound as at normal hearings, but TV, video as well. And, and we're going to, this, you know, what I'm saying to everyone, this is going to be very transparent, accountable. Everyone's going to have a voice into this, um, besides just the committee members.
But also I want to note that what, what the committee uh, supports, and we had this discussion, is that, that while we're going through this process of work sessions, we are looking at reviewing, having another hearing so the general public could come in for record, and I think that's, that's a great idea. Um, so if there's no other questions, Mr. Willis, you have anything you want to say? No, I just wanted to respond to Councilman Clark, it, and that is the creation of the record in addition to the video recording, which will assist the council in when you get to the voting sessions, if you want to recall what occurred at any one, you'll have an opportunity to do that in addition to whatever summary narrative that we might compose, the three of us might compose about every session. Um, but, and it's hard to anticipate, but at some point down the road, five years from now, somebody may say, well, what, when you're considering a definition, what was in front of the, of the, of the uh, council, either during work session or voting session? And so legislative record is, is broadly although the voting sessions are obviously more significant, but it's important to capture everything. So one last question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. I think it's an easy one. Um, could I, well, it's not a question. I'd like to uh, recommend that when we go on round two, that any amendment that we consider, and we should take time for this to happen, should be in written form. Yes, yes. And, and the thing is, I just want to emphasize that because I'm getting phone calls and emails and plus uh, people I've seen on the outside talking to, uh, like, when are we going to have this passed? And the thing is, is that we, there is no set date. It took planning five years, I guess, five years to, to work this out. And we, we're not going to have it on our calendar that we're going to do it within a year or six months or whatever. It's going to be done right. We're going to work together on this uh, as a committee and with the public. And so if it takes this time next year, it takes this time next year. But uh, we're, not, we're not under any pressure to have it done within six months or eight months or whatever. So uh, if there's no other questions, we're going to start the work session. It's on page three. And we're looking at it's the, yeah, page three, uh, Article 32, Zoning, Title I, General provision, Provisions, Subtitle I, Purpose of Title, and the title contains uh, the rules of the code. So does anyone have any questions or uh, want to issue any amendments in regards to uh, Title I? on page three, or the bottom of page three and page four? Page four. Page four. Let me, let me write this down, yeah. We had two comments in our report, and this is the uh, joint uh, agency report that was submitted to the council on September 19th um, regarding uh, page four. Uh, one is in uh, section 1204, there's a discussion of overlay zones and, and well, it's the section on conflicting provisions. And it was brought to our attention through the public hearings uh, that it would be useful to have clarifying language in conflicting provisions at a phrase that made it very clear that the more specific provisions, such as the waterfront overlay, would govern over um, the um, broader provisions if there is a conflict. So um, that would be in section so, 1204. One, so, Laurie, just um, slow down just for, uh, for a second. We're on page four. You're in line 15, 1204. Yeah, so probably resolution. it would be in line in the section B, most restrictive provision governs. Okay, B, okay. And we would add a sentence, uh, it would probably be a line 25, an additional sentence that would say that in, if in event of a conflict between provisions in an overlay zone, such as those in Title 12, the more specific provisions would govern. Okay. Now, we have all that. Okay. okay. So. Um, does anyone have any questions on, uh, on a, 
copy available today of the the amendments that planning is you have a, discussing. have you issued that that was made available i think i may have some extras Do you need, I have some extras if. Kara, do you need more? Yeah, okay. Uh, September 19th, it's in the upper right. Here. And that comment is um, item number 1-2. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the, the uh, Agency comments were not in page order, so I will read them in page order and refer to them by comment number. Okay. Um, the second one on page four is possibly a question, a concern. It, it came up from the law department, and um, it, we would defer to law or DLR on this, but there was a, um, a concern about the reference and this is throughout the code, it starts on page four to this code and a suggestion that it needs to be clarified in on page four as to this code is referring to, um, whether it's referring to Baltimore City Code or only the zoning code. And I don't know if law wants to further comment on that. Uh, I can, Mr. Chair. If you use the microphone. What I recommend, you don't need to speak directly into it because, you know, just if you can try to speak a little bit away from it so it's clear. Yeah, go ahead. Um, in this particular instance, it's on line four in page four. Um, it's pretty clear here that this code means this zoning code, but I think you do probably want to at least put in your definition section that you know, hereafter when you say this code, you mean one or the other, because you could get into some sticky situations later where you say, let's do this throughout the code, you know. Um, and it's not clear whether you mean this definition now applies throughout the si Baltimore City's entire code, or it applies only in this zoning article. So you probably just want to be clear when you, you know, refer to it as this code. I mean, it's you know, for example, in line four, it says in interpreting and implying this code, the following rules of interpretation apply. And I assume you mean in, in this article, this zoning article, not the entire Baltimore City code. Because I doubt you, you know, there, there are going to be instances when you, you might not want a particular one of these definitions to also be relevant in the building code or in your criminal sections or your tax sections. You just want to be clear. No, I agree. We want to be as clear, precise as possible so, you know, when, when someone reads this, they understand what we're saying. You, uh, so, so the, um, here, here. So you're just um, recommending some sort of adjective there for the word. You could either do in interpreting and applying this zoning code or you could really say article, because it's an article of the larger city code. You could, yeah. Okay. 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 Yes, Mr. Uh, Willis. Refer to law. Yeah, I mean, okay. I think you want to be consistent throughout the whole thing. Okay, so we're deferring to law. Okay, thank you. Any any other uh, amendments or issues regards to page four? Okay, now we are on page five. Do we have anything on five? Uh, Councilman Kraft, yeah. yeah. So, um, just so I'm clear, um, so anywhere where we have the word 
code throughout this title, we would be using the word article. As long as you're referring to the whole article, if you're somewhere later referring to say the building code or something, yeah, just be clear. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be. Well, uh, was there a, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Hillary, do we need to change it to this article or simply say at the beginning, if you use this code, it means. Yeah. You don't have to change every, the word code to article throughout. You can do it however you want, just so that you, you know, it's clear, you know, 300 pages from now, if you're <laughs> using this code, it means whatever it is you've defined it to mean. You can stick a line in in the beginning that says any time the word that, or the phrase this code is used, it's meant to apply to the zoning article. That's an easy way to do it. And then that actually, you know, it's a great point because that'll help you later if you're, ac you know, you happen to actually be referring to the building code or, you know, some other code. <laughs> say this article because this is an article of the larger Baltimore City code. The zoning code is referred to as the zoning code but really it's an article just like taxes or whatever. Yeah. Well, you're, you're right. I mean, maybe it's best to, to call it the zoning code throughout. I mean, whatever's consistent. If, if that is, in fact, the case, I mean, there, 200 pages from now, you could be saying, let's make this definition consistent with the larger code, and you could be meaning the tax code, the building code, you know, just as long as you're clear in, in each instance with what you're referencing. And I think, you know, um, Mr. Willis's point is well taken that the, the references in Title I, Subtitle I to the code, you probably have to be the most careful there because that sets you up for the rest of it. So it certainly makes sense, you know, to, to actually do the physical replacement in, in you know, Title I. Yeah. So, we, so we just want to make it as simplistic as we can for the general public and for everyone. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, we're on page five. Any, any amendments, any questions, or, or, or on page five? Um, you good? Yeah. Okay, page six. Uh, page seven. I do. Councilwoman Clark, try to give us the uh, the title number and what line. Oh. Well, it's title one. Yeah, I mean. Um, I, I will. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hand out these sheets. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, Stephanie, can you help me, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, may I go back to page six? 
I missed it. I missed we, are, we are on page six. Sorry, I forgot to give them out. My apologies. Um, Stephanie Murdoch in my office, who reminded me of what I had written, um, has extra copies for anybody that, that, I mean, but finish the table first, Stephanie, and then people at the table. Okay. Basically, this is kind of an issue that I pray that we will agree to. It's crucial because it is the place where we begin to say that the, that the city council has the, po has the power to grant certain conditional uses. Um, in the tables in, and in, the, in this code, as proposed, there are no conditional uses approved by the Baltimore City Council, but in reality, hmm? That great. Go ahead. In reality, of course, today, there are. And so this basically restores the city council to the conditional use approval process. And it does so in this place because we have to amend um, the C's, capital C's, that are in the various tables, um, tables and uses. P is fine. It indicates permitted. That's, we got that. C indicates it's conditional by the zoning board. My amendment then make C what it is in the current code, CB, um, conditional by the board. And then it adds back CO, conditional by ordinance of the city council, and creates those three letters as the ones to be in the tables, although we'll have to actually amend the tables. I think it's a very important amendment, or else, in many respects, we're, we're out of it. <coughs> So there it is. I hope so. We all agree with that. Yes. No Okay. Any question? Any issue on that? No? Okay. Okay, so everybody's okay with that? Okay. Stephanie, can you just keep track of what everybody's okay with? It may not be an arduous task, unfortunately. Um, okay. So is that, is that it? Oh, no. Yeah, that's it for page six. Okay. Yeah, no, it's not it. Anyone else? <laughs> anyway, I know that. Yeah, we, 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 we know that. Yeah, yeah. Which is a good thing, I guess, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone on six? Okay, we now we'll go on page seven. Councilwoman Clark. Yes. Um, it's in front of you. Take your time. We um, 216 generic and specific uses. That, I'm I'm moving to eliminate and delete the entire section 1-216. Um, when I first saw it, I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to have a lot of trouble with this going through. I I barely if ever saw the use of this term um, in the text of this. Um, entire 19 chapter or 18 chapter, whatever it is, code. Um, and basically, it's, it's like a loophole that, and it's something that I find, um, the idea of generic and specific uses, et cetera, um, I, I would just take this out um, because as we go through, I think we will find that some, some generic terms are so vague that in terms of permitted conditional use, it, it, they're irrelevant because people won't really know what they're about to get if it's a permitted use. Like, so say something like cultural center is pretty generic. What in the world does it mean? <coughs> um, that's generic. Now, it could be anything. Because you could define it as anything if you're coming in to get a conditional use. So basically, it's 
it's basically saying that's okay. And then it says, and then it takes out specific uses as sort of, um, it backs them out of that. It, it's, a, it's a philosophy of this code to try to use generic terms to cover an awful lot of specific things that are different from each other. And by doing that, when you, when you look at what's a permitted or conditional use, you oftentimes see something generic that could end up being, that has to end up being specific. And if it's permitted, you don't know what it is. So I, I'm, I'm putting that on for your consideration. As we go through this code, I'll no. probably be pointing it out, okay? Councilwoman, I mean, the flag went up with me too, because even, I mean, uh, first time I heard it, I know it came from recommendations from the planning. So my, my question to piggyback on Councilwoman Clark, uh, generic and specific, specific use, what is, um, what is the, what is the uh, purpose Allow or me. the mindset on that for okay. the planning? Okay. okay. Um, yeah. Thank you um, for the minute to explain this. This is something that came to us through a lot of our initial research in how codes are being developed around the country. Um, and the key piece with the generic versus specific use is any given use, it, the concept of a generic use is to group like items and like impacts under a common definition and then be able to pull out specific uses when they're kind of similar but have a different impact. And then in the use tables, you can't overlap between a generic and a specific. I'll give an example. Um, so if you have a um, we have one generic use, uh, retail goods establishment. That's come up. And that we have a very clear definition, I think, and you read in the R of what retail goods establishments are. But through the public process that we had the many meetings, there were community comments that certain, not all retail goods establishments by definition are really created equally. So we pulled out what would be typically a retail goods and listed it as a specific use. So you can't be both. In other words, where they're the same, they, they fall under one category. If it has an intense impact, the retail goods, for example, uh, you know, a, a pawn shop, that was one we pulled out. Well, yeah, it's retail goods. But through feedback, people told us, no, we want that one treated differently. So you look under the list of uses, pawn shop is pulled out as a specific use, and it is less permissively treated than the generic use. Um, another example is our light industrial. You know, that's a very generic use. Many light industrial uses go in that category. It's very clearly defined as the uses must be indoor and not have the, the external impact as the general industrial would. But the use doesn't dictate whether you can do a widget or, you know, what you're doing inside that building as long as you meet standards. When there is a particularly, um, a use that has a particular impact that needs to come out of that, like a, the, some of the recycling and recyclable materials, even though they're inside, they were pulled out of that generic use with specific standards. We believe it is a very, a uh, flexible tool, it makes the code easy to understand, and I, I hear the council on certain categories of generic uses, and I guess we would encourage, please don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So your cultural facilities, um, that is a broad generic use that would include a library, an art museum, a gallery, that sort of thing. 
if there is a particular loophole in that cultural facility that the council is concerned about, then we would pull that out as a specific use. You know, I don't know what, you know, what, um, not thinking of one offhand under cultural, but, you know, so you would pull that out, you would specifically define it and then treat it differently in the tables. So back to the councilwoman's that, that P, C, B, C, O, and blank, those, that's your, your crux of your uses. So a use is either not permitted, it's blank on that table, it's permitted, it's based on the council's amendment conditional to the board or conditional by ordinance. So the point in pulling something out of a generic use is to treat it differently. Councilor Kraft, go ahead. Again, without making a commitment this early in the process, I almost look at it in the reverse, and that is if it's not listed, you can't do it. Yes, that's correct. But, but no generic thing. So, you know, if it is a, you know, if it's A, B, C, D, and E, you can do it. But if it doesn't fit into A, B, C, and D, and E, then it's not an F generic that sort of includes. There is, you're correct. That's how it works. Well, in other words, you like, must meet. You're saying like usages that, that uh, are similar but not specifically defined. Well, and when I'm, okay. Okay, right? And you're pulling out specific things that, you, that are distinguishable within the like usages, right? Am I correct in what you just did? Say that again, you're pulling. You have like usages which are not specifically defined, and then when you find something that you feel is distinguishable, you pull it out and, dis and you give it a specific definition to distinguish it. It, distinguishable only if you want to treat it differently in its permissions. There's no point in pulling it out if you're going to treat it the same as retail goods. So your retail goods, if they're permitted in these five zones, and the only reason to pull something out is if you wanted to make it more restrictive to not permit it or to make it conditional in one of those five zones. If it's going to be permitted in both zones, it, there's no point in pulling it out. I think that, I mean, my inclination is that the definition be very, very clear so that if a person in a neighborhood sees a sign and it says that you're going to put up a, uh, a coffee shop, then they know that the, sh the shop is going to sell coffee. They don't think that it's going to sell beer. You know. Well, I think that's a good example. So the, there are restaurants, and then there, I mean, there are um, retail goods, for example, as a generic definition. A totally separate definition is retail goods with alcohol. So for that exact reason, and they are treated separately and differently in the code. Um, Retail goods. Well, she just told me to. Okay. It's more easy to direct to other people. Retail goods um, restaurant, right? They're two different uses. Okay. They're not the same. What did you just say? Retail goods what? You said retail goods. Retail goods with alcohol versus generic retail, retail goods. Alcohol. When I think of retail goods, I think of Target. Right. Right. I think of, you know, Macy's, right? And that's what it is. Alcohol. Right. That's why alcohol is pulled out. That's exactly why. I, I would never look for alcohol in any definition that had retail goods. Well, I think you, we can, um, when we get to that definition, okay. if that specific one is generic. the problem, Right, but that's not a generic use. That is a specific use. That's an example of pulling out a specific from the generic. That's right. And what I'm saying is, 
I think I drive it being in reverse and always have specific rather than ne ever run the risk of having a generic and having people trying to figure out what is included in the generic. Well, um, we would really urge the council to um, really uh, hold on any recommendation to change this. Um, it is the basis of the use tables and I think when we get into the meat of this um, it will become more apparent. Um, allow me on the industrial for example, we have a definition of light industrial. It means manufacturing or repair of finished products or parts from previously prepared materials where all processing, fabrication, assembly, treatment and packaging of products are contained entirely within a building and noise, odor, smoke, heat, glare, vibration resulting from manufacturing are confined within the building or otherwise minimized. This is a typical light industrial use. It's an example of a generic use. Now if there's a particular light industry that causes angst, you pull it out as specific. But what we deal with on a daily basis is applicants come into our office all the time and say, I want to build a building to make this widget. What is it? I'll give you an example, Councilwoman Clark's district for the brewery. And uh, let her let her <laughs> give clarity what she's saying. So there it doesn't have to be in your district. We've had them in other districts. But somebody came in and said, we have this new business concept. We are going to manufacture, we're going we're gonna to brew beer, and it's going to be wholly, it's a, it's a small brewery, it's not the big smokestacks. It's going to be wholly within, inside this existing industrial building. And under the current code, there's a separate use for a brewery, which was only permitted in the heavy industrial because in 1971, breweries were these huge uses, that, you know, big buildings, big smokestacks, et cetera. Well, in 2010, breweries became these little, small businesses, and there was no provision in our code for that under the generic use, the light industry, some new product that gets invented that falls under the light industrial would simply go inside that building and you wouldn't need to rewrite the zoning code every time you had a new use invented. And that is the concept. I think that better explains it. So. Um, okay, let's yeah. move on. I yeah, just want to make the point that generic, the generic philosophy of land use is not one that I prefer based okay. on the calls and complaints we get every day from constituents. We need to know in, in our code, if you ain't in it, you're not permitted and there's no conditional use. If you're not in those tables, and that's where I'm trying to get And that's back what we've to. done. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councilor. We uh, would joined by Councilman Bill Henry to my far left. Um, Thank you. And uh, uh, Laurie, I just want to, for a state of fact, we're not, this committee is not going to throw any babies out with the bathwater. So everything's under consideration. I have a couple in mind. Okay. All right. <laughs> so go ahead, Councilor. Huh? Yeah. You got a mic. You used the microphone so they could hear you, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Joan Floyd, and I did submit some some um, points in writing earlier, but on this one point, um, I wanted to add something to this to this issue. I have been struggling to find what the meaning, what the purpose is of um, that. What is B one? Uh, in this section that we've just been talking about because it talks about specific and it talks about generic. It sounds like what we really have here are three different things. There are specific uses which are the ones that are already pulled out and named and then there are generic uses. But this B1 
seems very unclear as to what it's trying to do and what it means. I don't understand what situation you would find yourself in when you, you'd have to decide whether a specific use does not fall within a generic use. The code, the next section already says if it's specific, it doesn't fall under generic. So that B1, I, I'm really struggling with to find out why, what it means and who would make that determination or when it would need to be made. Well, who would make it, how it would be made, and when it would be needed to be used. That's, that's what I wanted to add to this particular debate. Um, now, I also have a section to go back to uh, that, we, that we didn't talk about yet, just briefly. 213, is it a good time for me to, on, also on page seven? Should I do that now? Or you might have someone else who wants to speak about 216. I, no, I, I just have one other. Yeah, let, let her finish her, what she, and yeah. then we'll go. But I, I, we understand, I mean, who, it's the interpretation and who makes that decision. That's what you're saying. And what is the purpose of that section even in there? I, and I'm glad Mr. Willis is here because I think it's probably what he's here for, <laughs> to help us with those things. Councilwoman. Clark. Uh, yes, I, here's my financial aid. It's a typo. I got a uh, page. Uh, oh no, it's not. It's not on page eight. eight. <laughs> um, and well, we're still on page seven. Guess. What are you on page? No, no, I'm. I'm sorry. I, I, my apologies. Okay. I don't have anything else on seven. You don't have any? Okay. Who has something on page seven? And I had something on 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 the top of page seven, number number two thirteen. And there was that phrase, and I just wanted to put the question there, the phrase at the end of the sentence, as their context implies. I'm not familiar with that language. I know that these codes commonly say uh, interpreted along with ordinary meaning. I know I'm familiar with that. I'm not familiar with that extra uh, language, and I, I'm questioning whether you know, is that something we see every uh, other place? Is it something that's common? Is it actually helpful? Or could it actually be, you know, problematic? I'm just putting that out there. I don't have any comment on that last phrase. If, if, if somebody wants to delete it, I, I would defer to the lawyers. You're saying as yes, their context sorry. implies. It seems in plain English to pretty clear, but if the lawyers have a problem with it, I don't have an opinion. So we're saying defer to the law department. I mean, John, you have anything? <laughs> Hillary? Does it, is it necessary? You know, a, a court, if you, if you took out both that phrase and the entire thing on specific and generic, the court would just imply it mostly right back in. You know, I mean, they're going to imply this stuff that's been written anyway. A court isn't going to know how to interpret this other than your specific intention. So if you specifically intend something, write it down. If you don't, a court will put in a specific is different than a generic, and a court will put in interpret things in context. Certainly, you can do whatever you wish. It's always, I mean, going, to, it's always going to be taken in contact. Right. 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 It, it's, it doesn't matter either way. It's, it's essentially redundant. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter. It has no substance to it. Complicating. I think when we're, when we're first starting out, I think one of the things we should be really trying to do is make this as simple, simple. as possible so that if somebody reads this and they just say terms not defined in this code or to be t interpreted in accordance with their ordinarily accepted meanings, period, everybody understands that. 
If you put in there as their context implies, then somebody sitting there thinking, well, what the hell does that mean? You know, when I read it and I say, in accordance with their ordinarily accepted cat meanings, I know that a cat is a cat. But if I say, as their context implies, then if it means, you know, if, you know, if a cat has an orange tail, what type of cat is it? You know, or if it's a cat, that, you know, has two long fangs in the front, is it a saber-toothed tiger? You know, I mean. <laughs> I think what might be helpful, and I, and I think your point about some, you know, clarity and simplicity is important, but maybe we could give you some, an example or two of how courts have construed the phrase ordinarily accepted. And that might be helpful in your deliberations down the road. Okay. But I've made a note of that, and I think consulting with all Okay. That's what I would be worried about. How is it important for a litigant for somebody in the party down the road to interpret that phrase? So that so so what you're saying, John, is that if you take that out that it's interpretation? I mean is there gonna be substance? Of course of course have interpreted that phrase. And it has to use phrases that the American Court of Appeals has already interpreted, so you know what it means. So the council knows what Okay. All right. Okay. Well. All right. All right. So we're not. Yeah. We're not going to. We're not going to throw this out. Okay. I got it. Um, any. Anyone else? On on page seven. Okay, now we're on, on page eight. We, we had a minor deletion at the end of page eight. There's a dangling and. Where, where at? The very last line, 34. Uh, yeah. What is it? The word and. And? and. Delete that. Everyone agree? Okay. Now we are on page, yeah. Joe, are you on page eight? I, yes, sir. I just want one sort of general observation at the very beginning is that it, this section doesn't actually break down the generic uses from the specific uses. And it seemed kind of just. Yeah. In other words, what, when you. What are you talking I'm, under, about? I'm sorry, subtitle three definitions. I'm sorry. Subtitle three. Okay. Page eight. Subtitle three. You say it slowly because we're having a hard time, typical time trying sorry, to. Sorry, I can't hear. Yeah, you've got to slow down. Subtitle three definitions. This, this appears to be the section in which you're going to get your generic and your specific uses, but they don't, they're just not broken down. I just wanted to make that observation. Okay. They're not separated. Generic uses. I, All I, definitions I, are defined in subtitle three in alphabetical order, whether they're generic use, other terms, specific uses. They're all de defined alphabetically. I think that's clear. Yeah. It's all and definitions. Just, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's exactly what, that's what I was observing was that it seemed like earlier we said we're going to define various types of terms, but they're not separated as to type. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Alphabetical generally works. Okay. We finish eight. We ready to go on page nine? Yes. Go ahead. Clarity. 
you could repeat the definition. If you could put a definition of specific in here, in this list. When we get there. The word specific. Or, or, or specific. If you decided to still use the term generic, you could define that in this definition section. Well, if you I understand your position, as you stated, I'm just saying if you resolve 1-2, May I, may I just, Mr. Chairman, okay. may I just yes, say something ahead. about that? The dilemma is, if it's a permitted use and it's a generic term, like cultural facility, I, I just pull that out. There's a lot of generic going on here. And I'm living next door to it, that, that place, that is zoned residential or business. And there's a generic use that's permitted there. I don't know what it is. Now, if this council is, is I, and I've got, I'm addressing generic issues as they arise through the code, as we all, but what my, my what I'm saying, what I guess I'm going to end up saying is if you're going to keep them, then they have to be defined for what they represent. You've got to tell us in the definition of that category what that includes. Because in, the, in codes like this, what is not in the code as permitted conditional board conditional ordinance is not you there's no place you can go to get it you can't get it in your in your on your property and that's a very handy thing to have and addressing what was uh, this brewery issue last night in the city council councilman branch introduced an ordinance to let breweries be permitted or conditional or something uses in m1 we can fix things like what, I'm sorry, Ms. Feinberg describes, and I appreciate her bringing up my district. I'm just having a problem with it right now about something else um, because it was very helpful and we're glad to have them. But that's what we do. And I'm concerned, finally, about who decides what is included in that generic use. And I, I know it's not us. go through this entire process, you can add definitions in here if you think that oh, adds yeah. clarity. Yeah, I am. That's the point, generic point I was trying okay. to make. And you could even define the word specific if you wanted to define the word here. It would probably be more helpful to define generic. Well, well either, either yeah. word. It's just Both. keep that in mind as you go through this. If you want to add to the definition section, it's not that hard since it's an alphabetical order. You can, you can add That's a fine. word in here. Technically hard. I'm not, you know, I, I, Sometimes it's difficult to deal with change when it's, yeah. Right. And you really won't know what the definition section looks like because as you go through this whole thing, you may find another word that needs to be defined or something that okay. needs clarity. It's still, on, it's still under consideration. So we are now on page nine. Does anyone have anything on page? Of page nine, Joan. Just a, a quick um, thing that can be easily fixed, which is that E and F. John, I can't for some reason. We can't understand you, and we need to. Am I not? Is this okay? Because I thought we were supposed to stay away from it. So I'm sorry, I did the wrong thing. But as long as you, yeah. E, e and F on page nine. E and F. Adj adjacent and adjoin. I would like to see those. Um, be both adjectives or both verbs, and I would think both adjectives is really what you probably want there. Adjacent and adjoining, I think, is what you really want. And it's easily fixed. Parallelism. Yes, ma'am, parallelism. 
I would just like to note for the council that um, the definitions of adjacent and adjoin were written by legislative reference and very carefully done. And we certainly defer to legislative reference on that item. And I think you will find that there is an important distinction between those. You can discuss that with legislative reference. <laughs> that was their wording. Okay, Joan. Well, I mean, it we seems like it. it just seems like a mistake because adjo adjacent. We got it. We okay. Got it. Okay. All right. Okay. You. You. Yeah. I, thank you. <laughs> oh. Okay. Still on page nine. Any, anyone else on page nine? Oh, I would like to say one thing. No, I have nothing here. Um, I do have amendments that have to do with adult uses. Um, and, and that on page nine? That's short. But not okay. On, but I'm, I'm not changing the definition. Okay, just a moment. Later on. Okay, when it comes to use? And, okay. And, and, um, and um, oh, you know the word. Um, yeah. I got it. So when we get to those use, yeah, you have the amendment. Yeah, when we get there, you'll see them. Okay. Uh, page 10. Okay, nothing on page 10. We will now go on page 11. Just the bottom of page, or um, the typo financially. Uh, and, line 11. Oh, that's fine too, yeah. Financially, it should be, the word financial should be financially. It was a tough one, but we worked it out. <laughs> Wait a second, which side am I on? Oh, we're on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyone else on 11? Now we're on page. Page 12. Have anything on 12? Okay. Uh, nothing on 12. No changes on 12. Uh, 13. Councilor Kraft, 13. And then Mary Pat Clark. On line seven to um, seven to eleven, uh, this is something that was raised by the um, community associations in Southeast. Uh, we have a lot of decks um, in Southeast Baltimore, and we're very concerned about the um, incorporation of balconies and decks in the same definition. Um, the, um, you know, there is clearly a difference between a balcony and a deck, and there's also a difference between um, an interior balcony and an exterior balcony, and we're concerned about the differences between interior balconies and exterior balconies. Um, for example, one obvious difference is you have to pay a minor privilege permit 
for an exterior balcony, and you don't have to pay one for an interior balcony. Um, but the, uh, the decks are a, are a big deal, and we're very concerned that there be very specific rules regarding decks that may be considerably different to rules regarding balconies. So we'd like to look at uh, distinguishing and clarifying the definitions of balcony and deck and interior balcony and exterior balcony. So um, those yeah, things. We, we have know. no problem yeah. with that. Um, whatever you would write. I, I actually, I think we may have made an error going from versions because we did have a separate definition earlier for balcony from deck. Um, so if, if you need us to assist in writing that or not, let us know. I, uh, yeah, I, I understand. You could have a roof deck, you could have a backyard deck, right? Right. Yeah. It's different from right. the balcony. Besides that minor privilege thing, though, like, you don't want to kick that in. Right. Yeah. We're so, low. No, yeah. yeah. Right. So we want to. So anyway, we'll we'll talk about that more, but we want to. Yeah. Line 29 and page 21 of the word deck separate. So if you're trying to separate the balcony, you've got to be able to do that. Right. Line, I'm sorry. Where were you? Line Right. If you have an it easy to put Right. Right. Just to find deck there and balcony in the other place. Yes, right. that's fine. So we want to distinguish those. Um, <coughs> Councilwoman Clark. Are you going to banquet halls? I'm on banquet halls. Oh, are you? Any, anyone else on balcony decks before we go into uh, what, banquet halls? Uh, I think Councilman Kratz and I both have. Uh, amendments, and since he has, I think, more banquet halls than I do. Um, I don't have specific okay. amendments with well, regard to it. We have concerns about it, so I'll defer to Councilwoman Clark right now on that. Ladies and gentlemen, basically, I want to define this thing into civility. <laughs> What's that um, word? Civil so the, civility? Civility, yeah, it's a word. Um, I mean, so, I, I have, uh, in, if you have a copy of my written um, banquet hall, now I'm adding to what is in the code uh, extensively. And it amendments the definition of banquet hall, and then, um, banquet hall means an establishment for which all events are directly managed by the owner of the facility or by a person or persons regularly employed by the owner and responsible to the owner for the on-site management of all events held in that facility and for event arrangements. <coughs> Two, that is used regularly for serving food or beverages provided by the owner or by caterers and suppliers approved in advance by the owner. Three, that serves designated groups which before the day of the event have reserved the facility for banquets or meetings and provided all insurance certificates, security contracts, off-street parking contracts required by the facility's owner uh, for, to which the general public is not admitted, five, for which no admission charge is imposed at the door, and six, in which no third-party promoter is involved or stands to profit uh, later in the, um, I, I then delete. So, so you want to rename this uh, wedding receptions and birthday party halls? I can buy the thing <laughs> and just don't have too many birthday celebrations at the same time because that's what happened in my business. Uh, I'm then going on to delete the inclusions which presume that banquet halls uh, provide live entertainment as an accessory. No, not really. And then I am, and then later, in the proper um, alphabetical order, I define promoter. Personal organization whose primary business is to organize, schedule, and operate one-time events in various leased venues through wide-scale promotions and advanced sales of general admission tickets advertised primarily by flowers, websites, e-blasts, and social media 
and customarily selling general admission tickets at the door. Um, no party promoter can be involved in these banquet halls as yeah. defined. I like that. Yeah. All right. Any questions? You have any? We would defer to BDC. This is not our. Defer to who? BDC? Thank you. Um, I have a couple of just cl questions for clarification, um, if I may. Um, I guess uh, starting. Do you want to tell um, us your, your name and? Who oh, I'm sorry, Kristen Mitchell with the Baltimore Development Corporation. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I just a question on your number two there, uh, Councilwoman Clark. Yes. Um, where it says provide that the um, it is regularly used is used regularly for serving food or beverages provided by the owner or by caterers and suppliers approved in advance by the owner. Can that include um, the person who is actually um, hosting the event? So, for example, if somebody is hosting a birthday party for their mother, can they bring in? Um, so, but so it can be the individual who's hosting the party itself. It doesn't have Absolutely. to. Absolutely. It's just okay. that, the, that it's mainly the drinks that are, you know, like these promoters say, well, you know, we'll bring our own alcohol. And then they serve like they sell <coughs> bottles to a guest. So uh, everything, ha m what this mainly does is it puts it on. Whoever owns this um, place, location, is all on that person who we know, at least they own the property, we can do something. Promoters don't live in real life, they live in cyberspace. Yeah, I just, I just want to make sure that if I, okay. Um, and then um, with respect to I guess I, I'm interested in um, discussing further the um, removal of live entertainment as an accessory use. Typically when you hold a wedding, you might have a band or a DJ. Would that, how would you propose to handle that? I would propose to um, have the owner of the venue, once this code is approved, go to the zoning board and get it as a conditional use. Okay, so one time, but it would have to, so, in other words, they wouldn't have to go every time they want to hold up. Okay. But I want that guy to have to show up at least once before some public body to show his face. Okay. And I think I have a question also on. Right, and that, my colleague who's better versed in this, um, there, it is limited. To, there are limitations to where you can even get a banquet hall. And who right. No, I, un I understand. Yeah. If there are limitations. There are limitations right now, not only on the zoning areas or categories B1 and B2 on where you can get um, live entertainment, but also in who is able to get live entertainment. So I don't even think that under existing, under the existing code, a banquet hall would qualify to apply for um, live entertainment in a B1, B2. They wouldn't qualify under the Not existing now. code. But, right. But th that doesn't mean we couldn't fix it in the new code, that they couldn't do it in the new code. Okay. But I haven't fixed it. No. So if if we're serious about this, then what's hanging off without my having written anything is the, um, see, I don't see accessory uses in this code either. So, uh, so I'm kind of hamstrung, but basically we, we'd have to put in some place, um, we'd have to put it in the table someplace that a banquet hall in certain districts could, it would be a CB, it would be a conditional by the board as an accessory. Entertainment. Live, Live yeah. entertainment. Okay. And we'll deal with that when we get to that. Uh, okay, Here's. but just let's not let it drop. No, I'm, no, no. I'm, I got can it. I, can I take a further yeah. question? On this Go ahead, Cam Go ahead, Councilman. Um, to, to stay with the banquet hall issue for a minute, because um, 
this is this is a, an area of particular concern for us. Um, we have so many uh, in Southeast uh, churches, um, former Knights of Columbus, American Legion, VFW, whatever halls that, in order to pay the rent, the mortgage, the property taxes, because most of them own their buildings, they, they just have these tremendous property tax bills. They have rented the buildings out, and what happens is they do give them to promoters, and then the promoters have these horrible events uh, where they pack them with people, with no parking, no controls, whatever. And, and this is what we're going after, to prevent this. Right, right. On the other hand, um, you have the church that does have a legitimate function to raise funds for the church or the school or a wedding reception that does want to have these things um, and we have to accommodate them. I also have Harbor East and a lot of other hotels and you know facilities like that that have, um, I don't know, what, what do they call their places where they have- Private rooms. A lot of them use, I don't know whether they use promoters, but they use somebody who actually puts together their event who may or may not be with the hotel, but may be someone that, you know, if uh, ABC comes in to do their convention or their conference, and as part of that convention or their conference, they are having dinner, dance, whatever, they hire someone to do that for them, right? right? So how would that fit into this? Or does that fit into this or whatever? Do we know the answer to that? Uh, I would like to. And I'm just asking. Can I, then let me, let me respond for a moment. What we really need is a, a bill that speaks to how people who, oh, like even churches, in other words, that has, we need a promoter bill. The police department's been working on it for as long as I, I can remember. It has not seen the light of day, but they will not release it for us to develop this. This is really a framework for how that bill develops. It's because there are some places that are, by, by definition, banquet halls, or they wouldn't even have be in here as a definition. But then there are other places that rent out. Now, in my district, it was a Scottish Rite temple, and they rented it out, and it was a pure promoter thing and it was a disaster with the shooting and everything else but we need a so we need a bill this is sort of like okay and then we need a promoter bill and I know that my colleague he's got one coming if we could get right and he's waiting for the police as we all are but this is a frame for many things. This is a framework for when we then re reference what you have to do, whoever you are, if you are going to engage in renting out. But I'm not there. There are places called banquet halls. This is what I would like to see put in, promoters in. And then we need Bill Henry and the police department's bill <coughs> so that we have the, the, a three-legged stool, or at least two. Yeah, well, Councilwoman, before you yeah. are, on, uh, uh, Councilman Kraft, before, oh. Before we go into the use, we need these definitions because that's where the problem is in regards to these banquet halls. Right, it's and that's what we're, we're working on yeah. that. So uh, we'll be discussing, I mean, the, the To answer Councilman Kraft's questions about the hotel, um, 
And you may be seeing a pattern um, in the definitions. Often they have inclusions and exclusions. My suggestion, I think, to the councilman's um, question about some of these hotels would be to add an inclusion in hotels to define what you are suggesting be allowed in the hotels differently from banquet halls. So in other words, if you want a hotel to permit meeting rooms or banquet rooms within the hotel, but not open up banquet halls to other standalone, you would add that as an inclusion in the hotel, and if needed, you could write corresponding exclusions. Um, and just to point out, since it came up, uh, the fact that we did not call out accessory uses. Um, just for the council's information, in contrast to the current code, the current code speaks of uses as permitted, conditional, and accessory. And that accessory use subcategory in our current code has caused endless amounts of trouble in the neighborhoods. Uh, Council McCraft can speak to accessory uses to gas stations, which I know have been a problem in the first district, and, and there are many other examples. So we very specifically did not list uses as accessory, and instead we defined accessory uh, in the definitions and clearly stated that an accessory use must still be permitted in the zone. In other words, Go ahead. okay, in other words, you cannot use accessory use as a loophole to get something in a building that would not otherwise be permitted. It can be accessory in that it's secondary, but you can't start adding things that are just not permitted in that zone. So we think that is very important closing of a loophole that is currently in the code because people go in, there's a list of accessory uses, and you know, the board said, well, that's accessory, you know, the applicant, I want that to be accessory, it's on that list. And then it grows, there's no, you know, what exactly is accessory has been very, very problematic. So I just wanted to clarify that since that came up. Okay, yes. No, go ahead. We um, the defi with, the, with respect to the definition of third party promoters and um, I guess I, I want to try to distinguish if we can from third, or see if we should distinguish between third party promoters and party planners. You know, like wedding planners or, you know, I mean, would, would they be able to plan events at these um, facilities? I would think not. I would think not. Um, so, right. So then my question would be back to your definition in, in line one where you say for which all events are directly managed by the owner of the facility or by a person regularly employed by the owner, does that, does that inadvertently exclude those party planners? It does not? No, that meant if you go to rent a room someplace for your daughter's wedding, which I have now done three times, <laughs> I promise you, the place you are is in charge of the place. 
They don't give up that. I have to negotiate with them right. as the mother of the bride. And I lied because actually my one daughter, she did it all by herself, so two. <laughs> no, it was Susan. Yeah. Um, okay. I just want to make sure that it's on the record that we don't intend to exclude those party planners not. who I would, don't. Oh, I would always want other people to have the thrill and enjoyment. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Must be nice. Okay. So we are, are we finished? Any other questions regards to banquet halls? No? We are go with banquet halls. Councilwoman Clark. Yeah, I'm I'm on page um I'm still on page thirteen. I have nothing more on page thirteen. Um, Any okay, anyone else has page thirteen? Joan? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, um, looks like line 25D, basement. Um, I just wanted to make an observation now, and I think it may be something we may have to come back to later, um, because this definition does not speak to use. It only speaks to the physical condition of that basement. And so I'm wondering, and I really don't know, whether there's any potential problem that could occur when a basement is actually physically a basement, but it's actually being used as the main level of a, of a use. And that can happen, and I think it's about to happen in my neighborhood. So that can happen, and I, and I know there are sometimes differences in how you calculate floor area or gross floor area and things like that, or net floor area based on whether you count the basement or don't count the basement. So I'm just making the observation now that it's not tied to use. And I just, like I said, it may be something we may have to look, come back to. So we're just looking at what defines your basement. Yeah, it's important that this is, this is a clear definition. Um, it comes up, of course, the housing code deals with it in terms of occupiable. Um, from the zoning code perspective, it, um, is clearly excluded in calculating building area for dwelling purposes. So that's why it is defined here. So in other words, when we talk about buildings being able to, the only place it comes up is when buildings are being proposed to be converted from single family to more than single family, and there's a minimum building area requirement that minimum building area excludes basements. So you can't count the basement to convert to apartments, and that's very important. Um, the other places would be the housing code. If, um, in this definition, when you say it's floor subgrade below ground level on all sides, to what extent does that mean? Um, if the, does that mean it can't have a window of any sort? Again, this is not the housing code. This is simply defined, any Basically. amount, this is really defined only for the purposes of calculating whether the building is large enough for apartments, and the housing code would speak to whether it's occupiable. Well, one of the things that I think we talked about during the public hearings was really trying to make the definitions in the building code and the housing code We'll the work with same. housing to make it make that so clear. That okay. you don't have these confusions because you can't have somebody reading one code and having it defined as something and reading another code and having it defined as something else. So I think we really have to look at right. I think it's the same, except that housing puts dimensions based on window area. Um, but we can work on that. Yeah, well, Not that, a problem. That, yeah. So if we could do that, because this whole thing of floor subgrade, because we have so many of these. With the hills, in yeah. Southeast, where they're down, or you know, you have steps downstairs that lead out, but the whole building, except for the windows in the front and the back steps, stepping up are. You know, get you out, but everything else is subgrade. So, coal have it too. Yeah. Um, coal. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. 
Um, anything else on page 13? Okay, now we're on page 14. I have one. Count, uh, Councilwoman Clark. Uh, bed and breakfast. Oh boy. Um, at this stage of the game, bed and breakfast, I am proposing to add to the definition uh, that is um, given. Uh, and the definition is, is one used primarily as uh, bed and breakfast means an owner-occupied single-family dwelling that, one, is used primarily as the owner's personal home, but, two, also offers lodging in three or fewer guest rooms <coughs> to members of the general public who have primary residences elsewhere. In other words, they're not rumors. Um, my, my, I would add to that last line, who have primary residence elsewhere, provided that the owner is in residence whenever guests are being lodged. Now that's coming out of experience in Edna Gardens Lakeside, and I've also when we get to the tables, I've, I've changed some of where this is permitted and where it's conditional. But um, that seemed to be an overriding concern of neighbors. Like if the owner's there, living there, and the house is big enough that people can stay there, well, okay but not if the owner's not there, not if there's not an owner in regular residence, not if it's really a local hotel. Or house swapping. Well, I don't even know about that. I, I haven't got anything in definitions for wife swapping. I said house swapping. Oh, house swapping. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, I, I would appreciate the, the um, committee's consideration of that change. Yeah, go ahead, Councilman Craft. Um, it, it's interesting because um, we had the same thing come up in our discussions, particularly in the, um, the Butchers Hill and Patterson Park neighborhoods where we had these, you know, three and four story Victorian homes where people call them bed and breakfast, but they don't reside there anymore. And so they've turned them into six or eight rooms, and they really have yeah. become um, hotels, mini right. hotels. So, you know, we're very concerned also that if it is a bed and breakfast, the person who lives there has to live there. And uh, if they don't live there and occupy it, then they cannot advertise it and market it as a bed and breakfast. They must reside there and be residing there uh, in order to use it as a bed and breakfast. Otherwise, it will fall into the hotel category and be governed by the hotel rules. Okay, what does, what does the uh, councilman and councilwoman, doesn't, I'm not an attorney, but on page 14 line, I guess it's line three, it states bed and breakfast means an owner occupied. So. Is that specifically stating in there that it is owner occupied? Right, but so what do you want? What are you reiterating that? First of all, it has to be owner occupied. Right. Second of all, the owner has to actually live there. So, you know, under uh, under tax law, if you live someplace, if you live in a house six months out of the year, you can get the homestead credit. You're, a, you know, you're, a, you're in residence. But that's not what this means. This means. If you, if there's a guest, so you've got to be there. Okay. Well, and, if my, you're, and you're not, then goodbye. I don't want to split hairs, but to the law, to, to both attorneys, um, does, does line three where it states own occupied, does that specifically state that they have to be there or do we need to, as Councilwoman Clark is saying, 
Does it hurt anything to put that piece in there that the owner uh, has to be there? I mean, is there? Okay, I get it. Yeah. I just. Well, no, we'll, I'm good with that. Just, but this is different from the owner occupied. This phrase says, provided that the owner is in residence whenever guests are being lodged. We're not trying to hold that person prisoner. They can go to. It circle the word whenever. The ocean. Right. In my, in my, uh, yeah. Okay, well, that's fine, but the idea is you're down the ocean, you sh shut your house up, or you know, you, you're not, you don't have anybody staying there when you're out of town. You're like Joe Wallman, and you go to spring training for six weeks, and then you rent your house out. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm, they're creating problems that I think we could solve. I understand. I understand. But I think it's just a matter of language to get to your... Okay. So just so you understand. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll do that, and then we'll wait or for the opinion. Just, I mean, we could just make, we could go to the tables and just make it harder to even have the right to do it. I mean, which I've already done late, you, when we get Later to the tables. On. Okay. I'm with you. Any, anyone else? Uh, page 14, yeah, Councilman Kraft. Um, billboards. I would like to, I, I know there was a big fight on, on billboards many, many years ago, um, and I don't know how to do this, so I just want to put it on the, I know, but I, I want to put it on the table as something just to think about. But I know that if you look in, in many areas around the country, there are certain areas where in the downtowns or in entertainment areas or something like that, billboards make the area more attractive. They make them come alive, they make them vibrant. And I think that we should have and try to find some type of provision to allow for them in certain areas uh, of the city and to figure out how to accomplish that. Um, and I'm not picking, I'm not going to name any particular areas because I don't want somebody writing in the newspaper that Kraft said put billboards, uh, you know, in such and such a place. Um, but I think that, you know, it is something that we should look at very seriously, but we should have uh, a method of being allowed to do it within the code. And so, I don't know where it would go, but when we look at the issue of billboards, how we would do it. I think that would so, be easy so, to solve. Uh, so my, my question, to piggyback on Councilor Kraft, are you, are you looking at changing in regards to definition, or are you talking about the, the use? And, and I don't know the answer. I don't think you would change the definition. That wouldn't be my recommendation. Um, if you look where they're described, where you can they're prohibited essentially it's in title 17 the sign section and my suggestion would be to work on a subsection say billboards are you know not permitted except and then describe the area where you want them and whatever standards okay. you know size lighting you know in other words do an exception um, it may be able to be done under the sign overlay district which the council would have the authority to create under this code there's a there's a provision for that so um that may be the way to look at it we'll deal with that when we hit that article okay. go ahead councilman henry thank you mr chair um i i uh, i think that's a great idea 
Uh, it, uh, what I would what I would hope that we would do pursuing that is revisit conversations surrounding the original uh, ban of general advertising signs from, I'm going to say, 1999. 1999. Uh, in, in which I remember the industry at the time was willing to look at future conversations in which billboards in neighborhoods would be taken down in return for the ability to put up new billboards in areas that we found less odious. Um, one of the things that I would recommend we consider in terms of uh, the definition section, if we're going to pursue that, is we might want to remove the exclusion for banners or signs mounted on street lights because uh, it is possible that that is something we would want to trade and let banner. I don't think you would change the definition to make the trade. I think you would keep that and then you could still make the trade because it wouldn't have to be within there. Well, um, if we took the exclusion away, then they would lose the ability to put up banners on streetlights under the current law and then giving them those would be part of the trade. Well, except that there's other people who put banners on streetlights, so that would have a significant ripple and, effect. And and I would I would, or I would the be, nonprofits. I would be happy to 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 put that exclusion back in, or maybe we could just restrict this exclusion more specifically to commercial nonprofit right. purposes for like when we do Main Street stuff, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, the, the, so. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, anything else for in? Uh, we're still on page 14. After billboard, anyone have anything on 14? I mean, on uh, page 14. Okay, so now we are ready to go on page uh, 15. Do we have any amendments or questions on page 15? So nothing on page 15. No. Now we are on page 16. Joan. I'm looking at line 22, and that's the carry-out food shop. Um, this, this definition refers to a restaurant but the restaurant definition excludes carry out food shops. So I don't, I think there needs to be some kind of a. Um, so so you're, you're carry out food shop? Is that what I'm you're? I'm on carry out food shop. And there's, I think was what basically is a mistake because it speaks about a, a restaurant, but a restaurant specifically excludes carry out food shop. And then the follow up, I, I'm gonna go ahead and ask my follow up question, which is, would this then be, um, if you're talking about a Burger King, would you be fitting that into the carryout food shop? And I'm just asking for you all, you know, to be considering whether you're, is that where you're putting this ultimately, or is that going to be put into a restaurant? So I'm just going to. A couple uh, comments on that. Um, number one, you know, not that this means anything, but when we started the first draft of the code, our consultant who was assisting us from Chicago, they wrote the definition just as restaurant, and we had to tell them, no, 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 you guys don't understand. In Baltimore, they're two separate things, right. a restaurant and a carryout. So just that, that does seem to be rather unique to Baltimore. Um, but um, the trick here was it is not a generic use. This is something that's pulled out. We could not think of a better word than restaurant in there. It does not, it is not intended to mean that it is a subset of restaurant. Um, so it, it can be a food establishment, something that, that would be fine. Um, but that's the reason for that word there. As far as the, um, again, this is, this is one of those definitions that we very much struggled with, um, as you can imagine, because there's a lot of sensitivities about it. Um, as far as the fast food, typical, um, they would 
could be either a carryout or a restaurant. The drive-through, as you've probably noted, is treated separately as a use. So you could, you can kind of mix and match. In other words, a carryout does not, by definition, give you a drive-through. Okay, so you have to have a district that also permits a drive-through. Um, so the carryout is simply whether the food is consumed on premise or not, primarily, and um, generally primarily has been defined as 50% or greater. Um, and that was our understanding of the use of that word. And then if somebody wants to do a drive-through, that becomes a separate piece. Okay. Now, she has a point. Yeah, Councilman Henry? I, I was just going to say, I don't think you need any qualifier at all. If you just say carry-out food shop means an establishment where prepared food is served in disposable containers or wrappers from a serving counter primarily for off-premises consumption, I'll point out that that allows several businesses who probably do not think of themselves as carry-out food shops to be properly treated as carry-out food shops because they are. For example, a 7-Eleven is a carry-out food shop. I don't mean if you're getting the pizza or the hot dogs. If you're buying a tasty cake pie, it's a prepared food that is served in a disposable container and wrapper from a serving counter. And the reason I'm making this point is if we look at these in terms of the impact on trash and litter in the community, a, they, they, you know, a, a, a convenience store is just as much of a potential source of litter as a sub shop or you know a Chinese food place that operates primarily as a carry out. Yeah. So I, I, I like the idea of a broader definition for this. Yeah, because like Royal Farm, they prepare food. They, they have prepare, some food is prepared there. on site, and yeah. some is pre. So that's that's an interesting point. Would, would anyone like to speculate on how a court would rule? No. Well, one way I could take prepared out and just say food. You're gonna have to. You have to. You're gonna have to use the mic because this is being recorded. Oh, but I, I don't. But I don't want to just refer to food prepared on site. Well, based on. Uh, your definition, if I were making the interpretation under the code, which is fine, I would interpret a 7-Eleven as a, both a retail goods establishment and a carryout. Yes. And therefore, if I were to determine where they could open and operate, it would have to be in a zone that permits both a retail goods establishment and a carryout. And that, again, is the, the notion of the, the generic uses, that you can combine those. It's not, one, one does not become accessory, because that has been a loophole. That's an example of your generic use, right? Me. Example of generic use. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. A generic use in combination with a specific use in the case of a 7-Eleven. It could be more than one. Right, sure. A 7-Eleven could be retail goods establishment and, well, um, and a carry-out. It may, sometimes they're gas stations, too. Yes? I had a question about but the, the important point is they all would have to be permitted in the zone. That's what is really critical. Or conditional and then have a proper hearing. I get it. Councilman Henry, you've got a question to the attorneys. I have, I have, I have a, uh, just a... Uh, I think it's just a technical question about the definition for carnival and circus. Um, it lists four different uh, aspects of what it means to be a carnival or a circus, and at the end of the third one it says and. And my question is, does that mean you have to be all four of these things to be treated as a circus or carnival? Yes. Okay, well then we, we, we might want to consider changing that to you know, I would, I would hate to have the circus not be a circus just because they didn't bring horses. Yeah. Well, 
Well, the, the downside of just making it or is that uh, if you have temporary stands or facilities for selling or dispensing products for human, I don't know, I guess it's in connection with these uses. Right. Okay. So that's, that's, that's still. So, we're, so, yeah, so, so if, you're, if, you, if, you, if you have either horseback riding ability feats, acrobatic stunts, trained animal acts, or clowning, you're a circus, and really, you ought to be. I would, I would like to think that we could maybe get one or more council meetings to count under this. Okay. All right. We may have to separately define clowning, but that's a matter for another work session. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll chair that one. So we have a response from the law department, which is going to regards the or because I. I mean, you you can do it however you wish to do it. Um, if you have four things in a list and the last second to last one has an and, the court's going to require all four. So if you don't want that, then you know take the and out. Um, you can be even more clear by putting an or in instead. Um, so you, it's, it's this or this or this. Usually, I think, and Mr. Willis can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, usually the or goes at the end of all the lines. At the end of two. It would go at the end of two and, and three, three, if you want to put it there. Or should be at the end of line 14. 14 and 16. Right. And leave the end so that you can't have any of those acts just happening without bothering to have the stands and the and the, and the, and the, and the, okay, that, that's good. So we just need to add an or at the end of two. Okay. okay. Anyone else on page 16? Okay. Um, it's like two minutes to 12. We've had our two hours. We're going to end. We decided to just have two hours uh, on each article, I mean, on each work session. So, uh, what we're going to do is when we come back to the next work session, which is the 23rd of January, we will start on Article 1 and page 17. Okay? Uh, what? We all did that. We did page 16. So, um, we are the next. The next work session is on City Council Bill 12 0152. Transform Baltimore zoning will be held on Thursday, January 23rd at 3 p.m. in the current room. Um, we will begin where we ended on page uh, 17. Uh, as chairman and, and, and uh, in regards to the members of the, of the committee, I want to thank everyone for being here today and for your participation. Thank you. Thank you very much.